Arab Tov Kharim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You are watching Israeli News Live. And this evening here, uh, those of you that are catching this on live stream, we've got a very interesting evening for you uh, in regards to the news that is taking place in and around Israel, especially Damascus, the things that have been going on there. And um, there's just a lot happening, period. Uh, let me just real quick, with, uh, regarding Damascus, though, let's take one look real quick at the scripture in Isaiah chapter 17 before moving on, uh, and then we're going to come back. This is a prophetic segment of our news broadcast. Uh, I'm going to actually take you into Jeremiah chapter 49 as well concerning Damascus because I think it gives a, a clearer picture of what's going on, and just by the grace of God, I hope that this will also uh, clear up some... Uh, some things to you as far as prophetically of what's happening in and around Damascus at this particular point and hour we're living in. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 17, verse 1, uh, we read here, The burden of Damascus, behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city and shall be a ruinous heap. Okay? Uh, it's got two folds, though, if you notice it. It's taken away from being a city and it shall be a ruinous heap. So the first thing that has to happen is that Damascus will no longer be a city. Then it becomes a ruinous heap, which is clearly what we see are happening, or, or what we see is happening all across Syria. The, the battles, the wars that have raged throughout the country, uh, the United States bombing uh, ISIS in different areas, of course, the civil war, the, the, the uh, U.S.-backed rebels uh, that, that, were, that have been there to topple. Uh, Basar Assad, uh, in his uh, particular, uh, him being the president of Syria, they were trying to topple him. Uh, he's been labeled as a regime, etc. And it has just been an ongoing battle uh, that is just, just does not seem to have any end whatsoever in sight. Uh, now, that being said, let me just share with you, um, uh, as far as uh, dealing with Russia here on this, Russia has begun to uh, bomb targets in, uh, in, in and around, um, or in Syria. Uh, the Russian uh, leader, Putin, um, has been dealing with this. We know that there was a, there was a private meeting where uh, Basra Assad actually went into uh, Moscow just yesterday uh, in a secret meeting there met with Vladimir Putin. This particular article right here, Putin discusses the situation in Syria with Egypt, Jordanian, Saudi, and Turkish leaders. Isn't that kind of interesting who he's discussing uh, this situation going on in Syria? He is discussing it with all the coalition forces uh, that, he that he has been cooperating with uh, that is part of the Edom regime, the Esau regime, the Psalm 83 uh, confederacy there where the Vatican is actually running this show, but they've chose their new warlord, Vladimir Putin, to actually carry out the actions in the region there. Uh, it's very clear the United States has certainly been pushed completely out of the picture when it comes to Syria, when it comes to fighting the Vatican's wars. Uh, whether or not they're going to be used in the near future or not, I have no idea. I'm not really sure regarding that there. Uh, but it is, it is evident, though, that Russia and Vladimir Putin is, clearly has the upper hand in the events that are taking place there uh, in uh, Syria and in the Middle East period there. Uh, I want to take and, and, um, and quickly uh, back up on some things here. In one of the airstrikes that Russia did, this is on Israel National News, uh, they, they, they hit a Syrian field hospital and killed 13 people there. It says in the article here, at least 13 people, including medical staff, were killed when Russian warplanes struck a field hospital in northwest Syria. The Syrian Observatory of Human Rights said Wednesday 13 people were killed in Russian airstrikes on Tuesday on, an, uh, on a field clinic in the town of Sarmin, including a uh, uh, psychotherapist, a guard, and a civil defense min minister. Uh, just a little quick catch on that right there. But the, but the most important thing that has been taking place is the fact that uh, Russia um, has actually started bombing in Damascus, starting the bombing in Damascus there. And uh, let me just pull this up for you here um, so that you can see some of the images here. Uh, 
I've been preparing in so many other different areas already at this particular point here that I have not been able to get uh, everything up that I wanted to get up for you guys. This right here though is a, is a very good picture here that you're seeing on your screen now. I'm going to kind of blow this up a little bit for you so that uh, you can actually see this in the screen here. Uh, this is some of the areas there where Russia has been bombing and as you can see the buildings there are just becoming a pile of rubble. And this is one of the reasons why I say that uh, Damascus, when it says it ceases as being a city, all right, let's look at the scripture again. Uh, Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. That clearly identifies to us that Damascus does not just fall all at one time. They're taken away from being a city. We already see the refugees by the, by the hundreds of thousands of, uh, over a million refugees have fled Syria and have gone to seek uh, uh, shelter mostly in Europe, but also the United States. Uh, very few in Turkey and Saudi Arabia has taken some, taken some in as well, but the, the majority of them have gone into the European nations there, uh, fleeing there. So they have been taken away as being a city. And slowly but surely, because of all the fighting that's going on in Damascus, as you see, it's become a ruinous heap. It's not because of a nuclear bomb that goes off in this city. It is, in fact, because of, of the uh, constant shelling that is going on there right now to start with. Now, um, I want to take you also, though, to Jeremiah chapter 49. And after we kind of review some of these things concerning Damascus here, then we're going to move on in to catch you up on some of the news that's happening in Israel. Very, very disheartening events that are taking place in Israel. The, the, the fighting and the battles that are going on there are just tremendous, to say the least. And we're seeing prophecy as well unfold itself in Israel. All right, now let's take a, a look. We'll back up here. This is Mamre, or Me, uh, it's actually www.mechan uh, for, uh, excuse me, sl uh, dash mamre.org for those that want to look at a Hebrew Bible there. I'll try to remember to publish this on YouTube so you can actually see that as well. But we're going to go into Jeremiah here, and this is going into chapter 49. Jeremiah has a very interesting prophecy outlook regarding Damascus. Uh, and it's far greater than what most people even realize. And he's also speaking of Edom, which is Rome, uh, for those that are not aware of that. And if we start with verse 17 here, it says, And Edom shall become an astonishment. Everyone that passeth by it shall be astonished and shall hiss at all the plagues thereof. So God has a judgment for Rome, needless to say. And he says, as in the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighboring cities thereof, saith the Lord, no man shall abide there, neither shall uh, any son of man dwell therein. That's interesting right there. Behold, he shall come up like a lion from the thickets of, of, the, of the Jordan against the strong habitation, for I will suddenly make him run away from it, and whoso is chosen him will I appoint over it for for who is like me, and who will appoint me a time, and who is that shepherd that, that will stand before me? Therefore hear ye the counsel of the Lord, that, that he uh, hath taken against Adam and his purposes, that he hath purposed against the inhabitants of Timon. Surely the least of the flock shall drag them away. Surely their habitation shall be appalled at them. The earth quaketh. And the noise of their fall, there is a cry, the noise whereof is heard in the Red Sea. Now, you may wonder, why does he say the Red Sea? It's because, the, uh, as far as the Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican there in uh, Italy is Esau's descendants. And Esau is connected to the Pharaoh of Rome. And of course, no, no big deal there. We also find that like the Pharaoh of Rome, remember Moses in Exodus 15 sings out the song. Ah, let's pull, I got to pull that up. I, I really want you to understand the connection of the Red Sea. Okay, it's very important that we understand the connection of the Red Sea here. Uh, and those of you that, are, that, that like to tune in for the news, but you're not interested in the pr prophetic side of this, you might want to pause your video and move it forward if you're not interested in that because we have some very, very serious prophetic news that we must bring out in this case here. Okay, Exodus 15, 1, right here. Um, click on it there. It says, 
Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord. See, Ladonai veyomru lemor ashera Ladonai ki go o ga See, I will sing unto the Lord. See, and that's Moses. That's singular. He says, I will sing unto the Lord. Sus verekavora ma beyom. All right. The horse and his rider have been hurled into the sea. This is why we see in Jeremiah's prophecy that Jeremiah is speaking about the Red Sea. Uh, let's get back here to 49. He's speaking about the Red Sea. And why does he speak about the Red Sea? Because it's referring to the horse and his rider. You see, when, when Moses and the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea and went on dry ground and the water was a wall to them on both the right and the left, and then Pharaoh and his army followed them into the Red Sea. There were 600 horses and chariots with riders, all right? Not one, but Moses sings of one horse, one rider that he gets victory over. This is Moses coming with Elijah, Eliyahu, Moshe, and Eliyahu come together. And even Rashi, the great Torah commentator, spoke about that undoubtedly Moses would return in the Messianic age referring to uh, Exodus 15, 1 right there. All right, so Moses is getting victory over that Antichrist spirit that is nothing less or nothing more than Pharaoh. Uh, it is Pharaoh, and we find that through Hadad. Hadad was a descendant, Esau's royal descendant that survives the, the sword of David, goes into Egypt, raised by the Pharaoh of Egypt, goes into Syria, becomes the king of Syria, and, and we're fixing to read this here, right here in Jeremiah anyway, that uh, it's Ben Hadad, which is the son of Hadad, that was the king. Actually, we're not going to be reading that at all, I don't think. But anyway, Ben Hadad himself became the, the king in his father's stead and was murdered by, by uh, oh, who, who was it that murdered him? Wasn't it as Hazael, I believe it was, that murdered Yeah, Hazael actually murdered him. And Elisha had prophesied that the man would recover from, from his illness. But then Hazael murders him. And of course, Elisha prophesies everything that Hazael would do to Israel. And we see these things that actually came to pass. But later, the prophet Obadiah says that Esau's descendants migrate. The Jews record them going into northern Africa and then finally into Rome, according to Obadiah. And we find that Edom is now in Italy, uh, the place that we know today is the Vatican City. His descendants are all there, and now prophecy is starting to, to, to unravel here. So back up. Let's look at this again. And uh, that's in verse 21. The earth quaketh at the noise of their fall. There is a cry. Okay, remember how, it, I believe it's in uh, the, the Christian Bible under the, under the book of Revelation where it speaks about, um, uh, I've got to pull that up for you there. Just bear with me. My Jewish brothers, it would be good for you to know this uh, as well, to know that this prophecy exists there in, in the Christian Bible, in the book of Revelation there. Um, yeah, here we go. It's in Revelation 18, I believe, is right here. Let me see if this is the right one. Yeah, the merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. If you don't recognize the Vatican City as this right here, it's unbelievable. For in one hour so great riches has come to naught, and every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea and stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, the great city wherein were made rich, all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, and for in one hour she is made desolate. Rejoice over her, thou heaven and the holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. This is Rome, the destruction of Rome. This is clearly what we're seeing in Jeremiah's prophecy is the destruction of Rome. All right, so there is a, the noise of their fall. There is a cry. The noise whereof is heard in the Red Sea even. And the Red Sea is only, it's only linking the fact that she is akin to Pharaoh. And it's, it's like that drowning of the Egyptian soldiers there. Go on now. Behold, he shall come up and swoop down as the vulture and spread out his wings against Basra and the heart of the mighty men of Edom. At that day shall be as the heart of a woman in her pangs. O Damascus, here we go. Hamath is ashamed in Arpad. 
for they have heard evil tidings. They are melted away. There is trouble in the sea. It cannot be quiet. Okay, Damascus is waxed feeble. She turneth herself to flee, and trembling hath seized on her. Anguish and pains have taken hold of her as a woman in travail. How is the city of praise left unrepaired, the city of my joy? You see, it's left unrepaired. This is, this is why it says they go out in Isaiah 17, the, the, the city ceases to be and then becomes a ruinous heap. It's never to be built again. And now it says here, the city of praise left unrepaired. Okay? Verse 26, Therefore her young men shall fall in her broad places, and all the men of war shall be brought to silence in that day, saith the Lord of hosts. I will kindle a fire in the wall of Damascus, and it shall devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad. The the palaces of Ben-Hadad. Ben-Hadad is the son of Hadad who was Esau's own descendants. And God's going to kindle a fire there. See, God is paying back Syria for what she did with Esau's descendants there, coming down into Israel in 70 AD and destroying the city and the sanctuary in 70 AD. He brings that judgment upon her. It says, O Kedar, in the kingdoms of Hazor, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, smote, Thus saith the Lord, Arise you, go up against Kedar, and spoil the children of the east. Their tents and their flocks shall they take away, take, excuse me, take, they shall carry away for themselves their curtains and their vessels and their camels, and they shall proclaim against them a terror on every side. Flee you, flit uh, f uh, far off, dwell deep, O you inhabitants of Hazar, saith the Lord. For Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, hath taken counsel against you and hath conceived a purpose against you. Now this is very important. Very important right here that you recognize what's going on here. This is, I do not believe that the, the prophecies that you're looking here, I do not believe are in chron chronological order. I do not believe that Edom is destroyed and then we have this here. And even if it is so, Edom could be destroyed, but you got to remember Rome is not done with their dirty work because it's where your Antichrist comes from, comes from Rome. But notice what happens here. In verse 28, Kedar of the kingdom of Hazar, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, smote, thus saith the Lord, Arise, go up against Kedar, and spoil the children of the east. Their tents, their flocks shall they take away. Let's drop back down. Sorry, verse 30 here, I believe it is. Flee ye, flit afar off, dwell deep, O you inhabitants of Hazar. Now, there's a little debate over the city of Hazar. Archaeologically speaking, there is a Archaeological discovery there in the Golan, uh, just north of it. It's actually on the border of the Golan there, um, the Golan and Israel pre-1967 border. And this is where it's believed the Hazar is. So if we were to take it in that regard, now there's also some people uh, suggest the Hazar is down in Saudi Arabia. But why then would God say to the inhabitants of Hazar, said the Lord, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, hath taken counsel against you and hath conceived a purpose against you. Now see, God is telling them what to do. Flee from this area. And I've already told you what is going on in Israel right now. The Antifada, which is just getting worse by the day. The Antifada is just going nuts right now. The, the Arabic people there, the Palestinians so-called, they are murdering on a daily basis the Jewish people or attempted murders already every day. All right? This is drawing all of Israel's resources to all the hot spots there, leaving Israel's borders weaker. This is exactly what Adam wants. This is what Rome wants. He wants their borders to be weak. They have Vladimir Putin working with the nations there to be able to overtake Israel. Now Vladimir Putin is the chief commander. Why? Because he has the same mindset as what the Pope of Rome has. So now he is their main warlord. And he's already in conjunction with all the Arabic nations because the Arabic nations love him. And of course, Vladimir Putin loves the Arabic nations. Even though Barack Obama was, in fact, he was a, a, a Muslim himself, he couldn't do the battle that the Pope wanted. So the Pope gets Vladimir Putin to go in there and do it. See, in order to fulfill biblical prophecy, to bring that bear down there. All right? 
Now, we see here, God is warning in verse 30, Flee ye. Flee far off, dwell deep, O you inhabitants of Hazor. God is telling his children that are up in the Golan, get out of there because there's coming a battle in that part of the region. Okay? For Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, hath taken counsel against you and hath conceived a purpose against you. My brother, sister, that is Psalm 83, the confederacy of the Arabic nations with Esau, Edom, they're confederate, and they're going to take the Golan and all of northern Israel. They're going, to use, they're going to use Hezbollah from Lebanon, and they're going to use the Iranian soldiers that are in Damascus right now. This is another reason why, why Putin is bombing and getting rid of all the problems that he has around Damascus there. And of course, when, when Israel begins to try to fight as well, to, to, to try to counterreact all of this, they're going to be bombing uh, Damascus as well. So Damascus is going to become a ruinous heap. You understand what I'm talking about now? So this is what we're seeing, this prophecy laying right plain as day in Jeremiah, and people have been overlooking this. I, I don't, and I personally, I don't know of anybody that's, that's put, this, uh, put the two and two together right here, who has or is. It's, it's, the, it's the residents there in the Golan. He says, Arise, get you up against a nation that is at ease, that dwell without care, saith the Lord, that, that have neither gates nor bars, that dwell alone. And their camels shall be booty, and multi, uh, multi, uh, excuse me, multitude of their uh, cattle as spoil. I will scatter unto all winds them that have the corners pulled, and I will bring their calamity from every side uh, of them, saith the Lord. And Hazar shall be a dwelling place of jackals and a desolation forever. No man shall abide there, neither shall any son of man dwell therein. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet concerning Elam in the beginning of the region of Zedekiah, uh, of Judah saying, Thus saith the Lord of the host, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the chief of their mighty. Now we'll stop right there. All right, as far as in the pro prophecy side of this, it is clear that we are about to see a battle there in northern Israel. And could it be that God is warning the inhabitants there to get away from that border? And I, I'm, I'm kind of curious too. I didn't say it as of yet, but I will say this here. When he tells them where to go, all right, and he says, Arise, get you up against a nation that is at ease. Go to a place where there's not a war, that dwelleth without care. I mean, is he referring to the United States? I, I don't know. I really don't know what he's speaking about there. But he's telling them to get away from this area because it's not going to be safe at all. Now, all right, let's move into to other uh, issues here. This is what I wanted to bring to you about Damascus, though, so you'd understand what's going on there. Now, let's take a look. Let's back up. Uh, some very serious situations are happening. Again, all of this is part of the Confederacy of Psalm 83 uh, that we spoke about earlier. And, and I will go ahead, though, real quick. I'll pull up Psalm 83 for you guys, so just so you have that. Um, and because we're going to refer to it here as we go along. All right. God keep thou not silent, hold not thy peace. See, Israel is in travail herself. For lo, thine enemies are in an uproar, and they that hate thee have lifted up their head. They got their leader. They hold crafty uh, converse or counsel against thy people, and take counsel against thy treasured ones or the hidden ones. They have said, Come, let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent against thee. Do they make a covenant? That's what you saw right there in Jeremiah 49, right? Okay, so now let's take a look right here. Another issue that's going on. UNESCO passes an Arab resolution. Okay, the cave of the patriarchs. They're going to call it, they're, they're making it Islamic holy site and no longer a Jewish holy site. Okay, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, which is what UNESCO is, part of the United Nations, passed a resolution Wednesday listing the Cave of the Patriarchs in Hebron and Rachel's tomb in Bethlehem as Muslim sites. Are you serious? I mean, is this really happening? You know, truly the Bible says that all nations will be against Israel. That's what we're seeing. The resolution which passed with a 26 in favor, 6 voted against, and 25 abstentions condemned Israel for archaeological excavations in the old city of Jerusalem, and particularly near the Temple Mount. 
and an initial draft of the resolution had also called for the Kotel Western Wall to be listed as an Islamic site, or more specifically, as an extension of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. But that detail was uh, hastily withdrawn after widespread condemnation, including from UNESCO's own Director General. You, they, you know why they did it? They did it intentionally to show Israel that they have authority over Israel. Now, I say that, keep in mind for my Jewish brethren as well that listen, they don't have authority over Israel. God has that authority over Israel. But they may exercise Satan's power because Satan is the one that put them in their place. Satan is the one that put these leaders in their place to fight their battles, to do their dirty work. But they do not know the counsel of the Lord, do they? Let's quickly look at the counsel of the Lord. Let's, let's, let's jump back another particular prophecy here that we need to take a serious look at. That's found in the book of Micah. God brings us back. In that day, saith the Lord, verse 6, I will assemble her that is halted, and I will gather her that is driven away, and her that I have afflicted. That's Israel. And I will make her that halted a remnant and her that was cast far off a mighty nation. And the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forever. So even though there's going to be an attack on our city, God is still going to intervene. Zechariah chapter 14 also exp expresses this. But he says in verse 10, Be in pain and labor to bring forth the daughter of Zion like a woman in travail. Now see, God says to Israel, Be in pain to bring forth. It's going to take the pain to give birth. Give birth to what? To give birth so that the Mashiach can come and anoint the children of Israel. You know, my Jewish brethren, we've got to recognize our sins. We've got to recognize where we went wrong. All right? So God says, be in pain to travail to bring forth. Go back to verse 9. Now, why dost thou cry out aloud? Is there no king in thee? Prime Minister Netanyahu who's not being able to deliver us from all this, this cra crazy nonsense. But yet we wanted a king when we had Samuel the prophet leading the nation. When God has a prophet leading the nation, then God is able to speak to the prophet and keep the people in, in line with God's word. But what did we do as a Jewish people? We've rejected the prophets. Especially the latter ones. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Micah, Malachi. They've all been rejected. Many of them killed Isaiah, cut him in half. Why? Because they spoke against sacrificial service. Jeremiah spoke against it. Isaiah spoke against it. So he says, is there no king in thee? In other words, your king's not going to deliver you? Is thy counselor perish? Maybe, maybe our counselor did perish 2,000 years ago. Isaiah called him the counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Has he perished? Did we do something there? Going back to verse 10. Thou shalt go forth out of the city and shalt dwell in the field and shalt come even unto Babylon. There shalt thou be rescued. There shall, be the, there shall the Lord redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. You see, it's going to take a deliverer in order to do that. Speaking of deliverer here, let me see if I can't pull something up for you real quick here. Okay, here we go. This, I, I need to bring this up, friends, because you guys have got to know it. And, and, and keep in mind, there is a lot of Jewish brothers and sisters that listen to this news broadcast, the, the, the teachings as well, especially in the prophetic side of it. I get emails from some of them. I have a very precious brother that listens. He is a, uh, an Orthodox uh, Jew from Israel. And, uh, and I just say, God bless you, uh, my brother Yosef. I just call, I don't want to know the, his last name, but he's a wonderful brother there. Uh, but anyway, uh, this is from chapter 61. This is the humane gospel. And for my Jewish brethren that may be listening here, many of the, the issues you have with the uh, Christian, uh, as it's called, the New Testament there, that you bring accusation against as far as the uh, um, contradictions and things of that nature there, you will find in this document here that was not permitted to be in the canon that it actually answers your own issues with the Bible there. So I, I think it'd be good for you to look at that. Anyway, let me take and drop down here real quick. Verse 5, In that time of trouble, 
Let me back up to verse four or verse three here. For you shall hear of great wars, also much talk of war, and many will be threatened with destruction. This is very similar to Matthew 24. And by the way, uh, for those of you that may not know, I think it's four different church fathers from the, uh, this is in the, the Christian beliefs, uh, from the uh, second century, uh, I believe the first and second century there, they were actually quoting, these were all Jewish church fathers here, they were quoting from the, uh, the Gospel of the Hebrews. And the Gospel of the Hebrews is actually known also as the, uh, the Gospel of the Nazarenes, which is uh, nearly parallel perfectly to the same humane Gospel of, of Jesus here. All right, so they're, they're nearly the exact same. This is where they pull Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John from. They actually pull them from these books right here. And the church fathers were quoting directly from that. They didn't quote from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They didn't have it. And this is why you can't find their own quotations lining up with the four Gospels you have today because they were using the one that they didn't allow to be put in the Bible. All right, now... But if you looked at Matthew 24, you'll notice it's very similar to this as well. For he says, For you shall hear of great wars, also much talk of war, and many will be threatened with destruction. Okay? So he shows that there's wars that are coming that they could totally annihilate you. And this, we're hearing that all the time. But you... But be you not troubled, for many things must come to pass before the end of all evil things. And in those days, the last before the great rest, those that have power shall gather to themselves in greed the lands of the riches of the earth for their own lust, and thus shall oppress the greater number who have not. All right, we're seeing that already. Right now, they are gathering the land of Syria, and they, want, they also want northern Israel, all for themselves to be able to drill oil. This is what they want it for. And they're oppressing the great many of the, of the others as well. Even like the Syrian refugees. Whether you agree with the Arabic people or you don't, whether you don't like them or you do like them, whatever the case is, these people are being oppressed by being driven from their homes and being forced into all these different lands here. Uh, it's, it's not just them. It's also the Christian people that live in these areas. All right? So... For it says, For in those days the many shall be held in bondage, but yet not in prison, and they shall be used to increase the riches of the greedy. Look all over Europe. They, they're, they're not, they're not quote-unquote in prisons, but they are in camps, refugee camps. You see, for what? So that these, these greedy, worthless, no good, filthy, dirty nations that want the oil and everything else Come in here, create the wars in order to drive everybody out of the lands. In that time of trouble, okay, let me back up. Every lust shall be worked against, uh, uh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, verse 4, for in those days many shall be held in bondage, but yet not in prison. They shall be used to increase the riches of the greedy. Yea, even the innocent beast of the field shall be greatly oppressed. For every cruelty and lust shall be worked against my innocent brothers and sisters of the great household of God. For many shall lust after the taste of flesh. Blood shall flow freely as high as the bridle of the horse. Go to any slaughterhouse, you can find that. And I know there's a lot of people who don't like that when I bring that up. But let me just ask you this one thing in, in, in speaking in this broadcast right here. Do you believe, do you really honestly and truly that, that God is an unchanging God, that he cannot change, he doesn't change his mind, that he holds fast to what he says? Do you believe, if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, which I hold that as well, do you believe Hebrews 13, 8, when it says that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Then ask, pray tell me then, if God puts you in a vegetarian diet and you think God just changes his mind as, as the wind blows? Oh, Okay, I give you a vegetarian diet over in Genesis. Even the animals had a vegetarian diet. And in the millennial reign, it says uh, in the Tanakh that the lamb and the lion will lay down together. They won't harm nor destroy in all of God's holy mountain and the lion will eat straw like a bullock. Is that not true? Sure it is. So God starts out one way and God finishes it the exact same way. What happened in the middle? Oh, God had a change of mind. Well, you guys, you can just kill anything you want now. You really believe that? <clears throat> you know you got to wake up. Why do you think they killed Jeremiah? Why do you think they killed Isaiah? It's because they spoke against the killing of the animals. Why do you think they killed Jesus, Yeshua? Why do you think they killed him? Because he came and freed those animals and set them free and said, if you knew what this meant, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have bound the innocent. See, he stood for the animals as well. All right? Now, I don't believe God changes his mind. 
But I believe God does have a permissive will because of our weakness in the flesh. But I'd love to see the restoration. And those that do condemn it, you got hundreds of people that have written me. Hundreds that God has moved on their heart, given all kinds of testimonies, wonderful testimonies, that they've taken a stand for Christ's holy way. God bless you. All right, let's move on here, though. So he says, in that time of trouble, no creature of God. And like I said before, those of you that don't believe it as being an anointed or inspired word, <clears throat> just look at it from a prophetic point of view. Look at it as a historical document from a prophetic point of view. Is it not being fulfilled? Is it not being fulfilled, these words? Sure they are. In that time of trouble, no creature of God, nay man nor beast, shall escape the cruel judgment of that wicked generation, save mine holy elect, under the charge of mine holy angels. For I say unto you this day that a strange Savior shall rule the minds of many. There's your Pope Francis. Well, he claims to be the vicar of Christ. That's a replacement of Christ. That's the Savior, is it not? He rules the minds of many. He's doing a super good job of that. The media is all locked down, hook, line, and sinker, and so is the politicians and the leaders of every world. They all come and bow to him right there in Rome. So that's what he says. For I say unto you this day that a strange Savior shall rule the minds of many, and that generation shall believe not in the evil of the world, but shall judge all evil good and all good evil. That's exactly right. The majority of the people still say killing and eating the animals, that's a good thing to do. God says you'll call all the good evil and the, good, and the evil good. For many shall the miracles of the strange God work in the earth. Remember Brother Kellen, we just had him on recently, and Brother Kellen had pulled up all these different articles, one after another, claiming the miracles that Pope Francis has been doing. So he says here, many of the miracles shall the strange God work in the earth and the people shall worship that Savior with much devotion for all hope rests in the God that is not a God but deceives the people of every nation. But the eternal spirit of all shall send forth his holy messengers and they shall restore the holy law anew which wicked men have hidden by their vain traditions and those that believe not the holy law shall perish. And that day they shall all, they shall, they keepeth my law and commandments be, be hated of all nations for my name's sake. For many shall be offended at the holy laws and betray one another and shall hate one another. For many false prophets shall indeed arise and shall deceive many. Yea, I tell you, in that age yet to come, the Father's name shall be blasphemed in a manner like never before in the history of the world, greater than even the star count of heaven itself. Remember Revelation uh, 13, 6 through 7? says that that beast, he opened his mouth, blasphemed against God, blasphemed his name, his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over every kindred, tongues, and nations. That's about what you're doing right there back in September when you brought the, brought the Pope of Rome to the United States and he spoke to the United Nations. You've made him your head. Remember, it says in Psalm 83, they've lifted up their head. They've lifted up their leader. You got him now. Now, I don't care if he's replaced or not. You've already given it. The Rome's got it. Rome can change any pope they want at any time. They won't, won't make no difference. They still got the leadership. Now Now they got it. The ball's in their court. He says, For hands dripping with innocent blood of my creatures will take up my name in vain and mislead many. And everybody says to me, Well, Pope Francis, he's a vegetarian. No, he is not a vegetarian. He, they say, Well, he promotes a vegetarian lifestyle. Well, he should live by example then because when he was in the United States, the very people that served his meal said he was eating veal. And veal is from a little calf, a little baby calf that they would not allow to be with its mother. Why? Because they lust for the milk so bad. Now, you can have milk. God's not against the milk. See, should be from a goat, though, not a cow. But anyway, they take that little baby uh, calf from its mother and go feed him a bunch of corn mixed with blood and everything else. And then they keep him lean and stuff so that his meat, or keep him on a low iron diet. And then that way they can slaughter him so the Pope could have his veal. So the Pope, they made sure they killed a baby calf for him. My God. Anyway, friends, uh, let's get back to what's going on here in the news here. I, my, my, my heart is just unbelievably taken away with these things. Anyway, so UNESCO, the, the whole point I want you guys to see is that Rome is so caught up in all of this, and it's Rome causing the havoc. Rome is controlling everything there. And you don't think they don't have control? They got control. Remember, the Israeli government, there's many wicked men in that Israeli government right now. Look at what they're doing, friends. My Jewish brother, sister, you need to really wake up what's going on in your own country. You're being sold out. 
Now, I don't say everybody in the government is, is crooked because I don't believe every one of them in the government is crooked. But we do know one, one that he's not even ashamed to admit it, and that was uh, Shimon Peres. He's the one that brought the Vatican into your country. He's the one that sold, uh, sold the uh, country out and promised the Pope of Rome that they would bring a United Nations force in. We've been saying it now for two years. And I even said that they would actually, Brother Chris sent me an email. I said, Brother Steve, he said, two years ago you said they were going to create a disturbance in Jerusalem in order to bring in a United Nations force. It's exactly what they're doing now. Anyway, so they're trying to lay hold of these, uh, uh, they're, they're claiming these to be Muslim sites now. It says both sites, however, have, have seen Muslims lay claim to them as well, which including the building of the mosque directly on top of the Jewish shrines. The resolution was backed by six Arab UNESCO members, Algeria, Kuwait, Egypt, Morocco, Tunisia, and the United Arab Emirates, who spearheaded the initiative on behalf of the Palestinian Authority. The only countries who voted against it were the United States, Britain, Germany, Netherlands, and, and Czech Republic of Esto and Estonia. The resolution deeply deplores the recent uh, repression of the East Jerusalem and the failure of Israel, the occupying power, to cease the persistent uh, excavations and works in East Jerusalem, particularly in, the old, uh, in, in and around the Old City. Friends, it's just getting, it's getting crazier by the day. Crazier by the day there. Also, another serious uh, injury there, four were injured in a car attack in Gush Etzion. This is in Judea, by the way, those that may not be aware of. Uh, it says an Arab terrorist attempted to run over a number of Israelis in Judea, Gush Etzion region on Wednesday night. According to the initial reports, Arab rioters threw rocks at two Israeli vehicles, one security vehicle and the other private in Route 60 between Beit uh, Umar and uh, Kamar Tzor. Passengers from the one vehicle uh, exited their car carrying weapons to confront the rioters and were subsequently plowed down. In other words, they were ran over by other cars. The terrorist was neutralized by the passengers before security forces arrived on the scene. Uh, Hasalal medics provided medical treatment to four Israelis injured in the attack. One victim was seriously injured and has been evacuated to Hadassah Medical Center in Jerusalem. Three others were lightly injured and also brought uh, to Hadassah. Um, you know, the uh, says Kirat uh, uh, Araba resident Avraham Hasno was murdered in a similar terrorist attack here in Hebron early on Tuesday. As an investigator of the attack found in Hanasso was run over by a truck and fatally wounded after being ambushed by Arab rock throwers at Al, Al Fawakar Junction south of he uh, Hebron. All right, let me I want to show you because we actually have uh, actually let's see. I, this picture right here is very sad here. He's not killed yet. This is where this Arab truck driver here just ran him over. He had got out. He had a club with him that he had made when they were throwing rocks at his car. And this is exactly what they're doing in Israel now. You get out of your car, then all the other Palestinians in the area are going to run you over and kill you. They're going to do their best. It is a major intifada, major intifada that is happening in Israel. And my heart is just saddened by all this. Um, he, he ran over him twice. He was claiming there was only an accident, uh, but he was ran over twice by the vehicle, and, uh, and he was killed. Um, and this is the Arabic guy that did this here. Um, just, this is where he first got out of the car itself at that time there. Uh, you can see that the, the, this is the Jewish man that was facing the, the people there. And right here in that part of the picture there, you can see the truck is coming, and I guess he's going to go to get into his car, and he's going to clip him to knock him out into the street, uh, and this is when he just runs him down. Now, here's the, uh, the audacity, and we're closing on our news broadcast with this here. After all the violence that's happening in Israel, and I've not even begun to tell you how much is really happening this week, didn't have time to go into the news tonight, but now they've approved 100 housing units are approved in Jerusalem for Arabs, 100 new houses. All right, let's look at the article right here. It says, the local committee for planning and construction in Jerusalem's municipality approved 100 housing units Wednesday in an unusual and rare step to allow large-scale construction for the Arab sector in the capital. This is reported by Army Radio. The move slated for Beit uh, Safafa has uh, been made just as Arab terror against Jews and Israelis proliferate nationwide and dis disproportionate number of attackers have hailed from Arab neighborhoods of Jerusalem. This is either insensitive or from a general lack of understanding. Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem, Doyle Kalmanovitz, 
fumed Wednesday night to the radio station. I think this is an error. Therefore, we will gather some committee members and demand an appeal. This is a bitter pill for us, he states. They gave approval to build the Arabs, and for the Jews, it's forbidden. This, uh, he added, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has, has, has imposed a freeze on Jewish construction in East Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria since late 2013, despite never having made a formal announcement confirming such a decision. Netanyahu only admitted to the freeze for the first time in June. Who then, ha who, please tell me, who's controlling Jerusalem then? Have we not proven without a shadow of a doubt they're internationalizing Jerusalem? Not just ourselves. You've, long before I ever come along, Barry Chumish, uh, uh, the late Joel Bainerman, uh, uh, Guglio Miotti, all three of these investigative journalists have proven to you that Rome is taking Jerusalem from the Jews. I'm Stephen Benoon. You've been watching Israeli News Live. Stand with us. Stand with this news broadcast. We'll be doing teachings later this week for those of you that have been looking forward to some of the teachings that we do. But if you support this type of work, stand with us. Support this work with your own contributions to keep this ministry alive. I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live. Shalom and good evening. Check us out on IsraeliNewsLive.org. It's on your screen. Thank you. Good night.